Welcome to Cure to Shin's webinar series. I'm Deborah Miller, CEO and founder of Cure to Shin, and we're really glad you could join us today as we welcome Pepgen, a therapeutics company targeting Duchenne muscular dystrophy and other neuromuscular diseases with next generation antisense oligonucleotides. Cure to Shin's been a big supporter of Exxon Skipping for over a decade, and we're pleased to see the field advance with next generation technologies that are poised to improve the effectiveness of this therapeutic approach. Kirishin Ventures is proud to have recently funded Pepgen's to Duchenne Research Program, and we look forward to this update on their Duchenne program. Liana Orlando, Kirishin Senior Director of Research, will be moderating this webinar. And at this point, I will turn it over to Liana. Liana? Thank you, Deborah. And give everyone my hello as well. I have a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. At the end of the webinar, we'll have the opportunity for a question and answer period. So anytime throughout um, our presentation, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see the Q&A button, just bring your mouse over the bottom of your screen and it should appear. We'll do our best to answer all of the questions come in, but please know that if questions are really specific to an individual situation, we might put those aside and work with the PEPGEN team to follow up with you individually after the webinar. So with the housekeeping out of the way, I'd like to um, welcome James MacArthur to the screen and he'll be our speaker for today. James is the CEO of PEPGEN and he's going to present an overview of PEPGEN's enhanced delivery oligonucleotide platform and how this innovation innovative platform is being applied to create transformative exon skipping therapies in Duchenne. So James, welcome, nice to see you again. Thank you, Liana. I'm really glad for the invitation. Well, terrific. Well, I'm really pleased to talk with the community and, and uh, tell you about the work we're doing at PEPGEN uh, that I think could truly be a significant change and improvement in therapies for patients living with muscular dystrophies. What we're creating at PEPGEN is a new way of delivering therapeutic oligonucleotides to muscle cells, the targets for muscular dystrophy. And what we've done through the work of our academic founders in the UK and through the hard work of the team is create truly a best in class delivery platform. We know that therapeutic oligonucleotides can improve uh, and increase dystrophin expression in muscle cells as long as they get into those cells. And so we've been able to demonstrate with our technology, truly superior cardiac and skeletal muscle delivery. And this will allow us to treat a wide range of neuromuscular diseases, including Duchenne muscular dystrophy and myotonic dystrophy. We've done a lot of hard work to get ready to move forward safely and rapidly. And we anticipate initiating our first clinical studies, uh, preparing for Duchenne muscular dystrophy studies in 2022 and 2023. Uh, the team is currently based in both the United Kingdom uh, in Oxford and in uh, Boston. And we're really pleased that we've had the support of some terrific groups, including Cure Duchenne at a financial level, as well as supporting us in other ways, RA Capital, Oxford University and Oxford Science uh, Innovation. Let me first cover a bit of background. So we know that Exxon Skipping can be an incredibly efficient way of producing, at least in preclinical studies, dystrophin. And to date, four different exon skipping oligonucleotide approaches have been approved. Exon is 51, Sarepta's first program in exon 51, the Dilepso from NS Pharma targeting exon 53, Beyond is 53, also from Sarepta targeting exon 53, and Amond is 45, uh, targeting exon 45, also from Sarepta. Now, while each of these has been able to be demonstrable as increasing dystrophin levels in muscle biopsies, the levels so far have not been what we might hope to see. At best, patients have seen dystrophin levels at about six, perhaps 5% in the best case scenario and below 1% in other scenarios. Now, what is clear is if you can get levels of dystrophin up high enough, this will have a really dramatic impact, both in terms of muscle function, as well as all of the other uh, disease uh, parameters that impact patients and their families. And to do this, what we need to do is get to something in the neighborhood of about 10 to 
of wild type dystrophin levels. This has been based on a variety of different uh, clinical studies and natural history studies that indicate that if we can achieve that 10% of normal dystrophin levels, there'll be a dramatic change in terms of the life of patients living with this disease. It has been also demonstrated that so far, the approved therapies have been able to slow the progression of the disease. And this is a huge step forward, but I think we can do much better still. One of the greatest challenges that these groups have faced in terms of being able to deliver enough of the oligonucleotide is being able to get it into the muscle cells at high enough concentrations. And one of the challenges is as we begin to increase the concentration of oligonucleotide that we're delivering to a patient, the kidney, which is the primary region where it accumulates, begins to start demonstrating toxicity. And this is clearly not acceptable for a long-term therapy for patients. And so what else can we do to improve the efficiency of these naked oligonucleotides? And that's where we believe our approach with a new, improved and dramatically uh, enhanced way of delivery can solve this problem. We've been building a team at PepGen that'll allow us to go and do this. This includes Carolyn Godfrey, who's our co-founder and senior VP of Discovery. Uh, she's based in the UK and was one of the pioneers leading the development of this new technology. Ramin Farzane Far, a cardiologist uh, who's worked with many biotechnology companies and has worked with me at RA Capital, uh, is helping to direct and lead our clinical development program so that we can as rapidly as possible advance this to patients. Niels Fenstrup, a synthetic organic chemist, leads our chemistry and manufacturing group. Sonia Bracegirdle, our VP of Portfolio Management, also one of the early uh, PepGen members. And Jane Larkinale, who many of you may know through her work at the Muscular Dystrophy Association, has joined us recently. Now, this is really a team effort, and we're also joined by some really terrific thought leaders in the field. These include leaders in terms of the underlying technology and founder like Matthew Wood, Art Krieg, and John Watts, who are pioneers in terms of oligonucleotide delivery and oligonucleotide therapeutics. Pioneers in muscular dystrophy therapeutics, including Beth McNally at Northwestern and Brenda Wong at UMass, who many of you may know. We're also joined by Charles Thornton. And Charles is one of the thought leads, leaders in myotonic dystrophy, who really thinks that Pepgen can improve therapeutic opportunities for patients with, living with that disease. I wanna tell you a little bit more about our technology because it's really important to understand how this really will change the field of oligonucleotide therapeutics. Now, others have tried cell delivery peptide approaches, including as highlighted in this diagram on the left, an approach where you just add a series of arginines together. Now, this certainly does improve the uptake of oligonucleotides into cells. But the challenge is, is as you increase the number of arginines, you begin to see toxicity. And so groups have had to reduce the number of arginines to get a minimal number that unfortunately, although fairly well tolerated, is not as efficient as longer polyarginine sequences. Now, what our academic founders did through years of work is go and explore the underlying biology of what one needs to do to get oligonucleotides into cells. And in doing so, and through a series of experiments in both uh, glassware as well as in animals, they designed the molecule shown schematically on the right side. In dark blue are two regions with multiple arginines that are interspersed with artificial amino acids. This allows us to keep the really efficient delivery of polyarginine sequences while reducing their toxicity. One of the critical components, however, is the component indicated in light blue. This is what we call the hydrophobic motif that sort of acts like the screw on a corkscrew and helps allow the peptide to get into the cell and bring with it the therapeutic oligonucleotide that has such an extraordinary benefit. We go and attach this covalently in a semi-permanent fashion so that it doesn't disassociate from the oligonucleotide until it's in the cell. And we can go and attach this to many different types of therapeutic oligonucleotides to treat a wide range of different diseases, both different exon skippable populations in DMD, patients who have myotonic dystrophy, and other patients with neuromuscular diseases as well. When we go and attach our enhanced delivery peptides to an oligonucleotide, we create what we call enhanced delivery oligonucleotides, a supercharged oligonucleotide that can now get into the cells and do what it was supposed to do, 
fix the fundamental problem that we're trying to treat here. Let me first start off by telling you more about our Duchenne program. I'm not gonna bother spending any more time talking about Exxon skipping. This community knows more about it than almost anybody. But I will go and show you some data comparing ourselves to other technologies that are also trying to solve this problem. In this particular slide, you're looking at the ability to do, induce exon skipping in wild type mice, normal mice. And we're comparing here PepGen's molecule in light blue to a molecule that is similar to what Sarepta is moving forward, a molecule that has six arginines attached to the PMO. As you can see in the example on the left-hand side, when you go and look at skeletal muscle, PepGen is able to achieve fourfold greater levels of exon skipping. With more exon skipping, we're going to get more dystrophin production. Importantly, in the heart, this difference is even greater. Here we can go and see over a sevenfold differential with this hexa-arginine approach. That sevenfold more exon skipping that we're seeing that should result in a great deal more of dystrophin production and cardiomyocytes. And that's critical because as everyone here knows, the heart is one of the key areas that we must be able to go and express more dystrophin if we're going to improve the lives of patients. In this particular slide, we're actually looking at the expression of dystrophin itself in a mouse muscular dystrophy model, the MDX mouse model. On the left-hand side is not our data, it's the data of Sarepta, where they're comparing what one can achieve with naked PMO, an Edipleurcin-like molecule, to the PPMO, the hexa-arginine modified molecule. As you can see, the PPMO is much more efficient at producing dystrophin in mice than the naked PMO. As you compare in each case, skeletal muscle, diaphragm, and heart, the levels of dystrophin with the PMO versus the level of the PPMO. However, when we go and compare what they can do with this technology in these tissues to what we can do with our technology in these tissues, it's a night and day difference. So whereas they might be able to produce 20% dystrophin levels in the mouse, in the quad, in a skeletal muscle, the tibialis anterior, we can produce almost 50, 55% wild type dystrophin levels with analogs of our clinical compound. In the heart, their production of low single digit levels is compared to our being able to produce over 10% wild type dystrophin levels in the mouse MDX model. And similarly, we see a huge differential in the diaphragm, another critical tissue. This suggested to us that this approach could really improve things if we applied it in the clinic to patients. Before I move on into non-human primates as a model, let me discuss one other approach that is moving forward towards the clinic, which we have great hope for. There are several companies that are advancing, advancing approaches where antibodies targeting or antibody fragments targeting the transferrin receptor are used to bring the oligonucleotide into cell. One of these companies is Dyne. And in data shown here on the left, they can go and show the levels of dystrophin restoration in the MDX mouse model following delivery of doses of 10, 20, or 30 mg per kg of PMO, a fragment of their drug. Using an equivalent system, we can go and show that with the PepGen approach, again, looking at skeletal muscle, we can achieve levels of over 50% in terms of dystrophin restoration, as opposed to levels of about 5% with the other approach. So we have great hope that we may be able to achieve something others currently may not be able to do. We've also explored, and this is critically important, the ability of our technology to go and do this, not just in mice, which can be relatively easily treated, but also do this in non-human primates. The reason this is so important is non-human primates are a great uh, system to go and see whether or not it will work as we advance it towards human clinical studies. And this is why we've spent so much of our time developing non-human primate data. On the left-hand side, we're comparing some published data from Sarepta with their clinical compound, their PPMO 5051, where they go and look at the ability of four doses in a non-human primate to mediate exon skipping when those are at 20, 40, or 80 mg per kg. And they look at the quad, the diaphragm, and the heart. Now, if you go and look at their efficacy at 20 mg per kg, 
in the quad, they're seeing about 5% exon skipping. Now, if we go and compare what we can do with PepGen's technology, and this is our clinical lead, we can achieve with a single dose, at, again, 20 mg per keg, almost 60% exon skipping. So in this case here, we have about 5%. In this case here, we have about 60% exon skipping. And again, more exon skipping will result in more dystrophin production. Now, when you look at this data, you think, well, they just need to go to higher doses. But one of the challenges associated with that, with this entire class of therapeutics, is as you begin to go higher and higher and higher for longer and longer periods of time, it begins to take a certain wear and tear on the kidneys. And so that's one of the things that limits us to use lower doses. And that's why it's so important for us that we can see this sort of level of exon skipping at relatively low doses of 20 mg per keg of our drug. Now, importantly, when we move from skeletal muscle to the diaphragm, we see similar effects. But importantly, as we move to the heart at a dose of 20 mg per keg, we can still see about 20% exon skipping in the heart following a single dose. If we go and look at Sarepta's data at 20 mg per keg, essentially it's undetectable at that level. And so we think this is really important because although we all might hope to begin to start producing more dystrophin in skeletal muscle, we really need to start producing more in the heart. We've now moved forward and done multi-dose studies in non-human primates and seen similar results. And we see a really good safety profile, which again is critically important as we move this forward into human clinical studies. When we go and look at, is this a phenomenon of just one type of muscle? The answer is no. So we can go and show with a single dose in biceps, in the gastric nemus, in the quadriceps, the diaphragm, the heart, the wadenum, and esophagus, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. All of these take up oligos very efficiently when they're coupled with our enhanced delivery peptides. Our EDOs get to all the tissues that are really important. And our goal is to go and extend this. We're starting off right now with exon 51 skippable patients, but we plan on expanding into other indications. The next one likely to be exon 53 and so on and so forth. And we hope to move to smaller and smaller skippable patient populations moving forward, taking the knowledge and the learnings and our understanding from our first Exxon 51 program and applying them to each and every one of these programs. And we expect that this will make us smarter and more efficient and hopefully able to address eventually a much larger portion of this patient population. Now I've mentioned to you that safety is critically important. And so let me just give you a high level summary of what we've seen to date across a range of different non-human primate studies, we've seen no mortality and no serious adverse events. The therapeutic doses we've chosen are well tolerated. So we can see really good exon skipping at doses of like 20 mg per gig, and they are incredibly well tolerated with no adverse events associated with those. We've seen no impact on body weight, and we've seen no changes both at a gross level or microscopically in terms of organs where one might imagine seeing problems at therapeutic doses. Where we have seen at high doses, transient changes in two kidney markers, urea and creatine, we've seen that they go up and they come back down. And again, histologically, there have been no sequelae, no impact of these transient changes. So we're really hopeful that this will be well tolerated as we move forward. And we've still got a lot more work to do, but we look forward to seeing whether or not this will produce really meaningful levels of dystrophin in skeletal muscles and the hearts of patients safely and in the future. I will also say that this technology, it can be applied to a variety of different diseases. So right now we're looking across a range of neuromuscular diseases to see where else can we go and help out? Where else can we go and deliver therapies that'll have a really impact, meaningful impact on patients? But we're also looking at what else can we do in terms of making changes to our peptide that might allow us to go after other diseases, diseases like Friedrich's ataxia or diseases like spinal cerebellar ataxia. I'm on the board of directors and scientific advisory board of the Friedrich Ataxia Research Alliance. And so I have a really close affiliation and association with these patients and so many patients in the rare disease community. And so I really wanna see this technology applied to as many different diseases and help out as many patients as we possibly can. 
as I've just told you, we plan on expanding from one to the next, to the next, and to the next. Exxon skippable patient population in DMD, learning as we go, and hopefully delivering therapies that really make a difference to patients. We're also planning on moving into myotonic dystrophy. Now we anticipate our first clinical study will be in DMD, and that'll start in the beginning of next year. And our second clinical study, the program that's following on this one, is actually in myotonic dystrophy, and that'll start at the end of next year. But we anticipate having clinical studies in additional indications in every subsequent year going forward. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say that hopefully I've been able to show you and convince you that we have what I think is a truly best in class oligonucleotide delivery platform that can be applied across a range of different neuromuscular diseases and across a range of different exon skippable DMD patient populations. Uh, that we show just extraordinary delivery to both skeletal muscle as well as cardiac muscle and all muscle types that are impacted by these diseases. And that this will allow us to have an impact in a range of different neuromuscular diseases. We also believe we're really on track for our first in human studies in Q1 of next year and very rapidly moving into first in patient studies. Um, as I'd mentioned, we're really fortunate to have the support of a great uh, group of investors, as well as having a great team here located in Boston and Oxford. And again, I just want to highlight the support of Cure Duchenne, Shen, which has been really essential to us moving forward. And with that, I'll thank you and open it up to questions. Thank you so much, James. I, you know, it's, I always love seeing um, the whole story of all in one go. It's, it's really very compelling. Um, we have a bunch of questions that came in. I'll just reiterate to everyone. If uh, you have a question you'd like to submit, you can do so by um, clicking on the, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to, to get to all of them. Um, the, so one of the first questions that came in actually is sort of on logistics also. So these slides, typically the slides won't be available, but the, the webinar is being recorded and you'll be sent a link of the recording where you can find it on our website uh, if you want to go back and view it again or share it with anybody else who maybe couldn't attend today. So, um, so we've got a number of questions. I'll start with the, the preclinical ones. Um, uh, one of the first few slides that you showed, I think, in MDX mice had a, a range of uh, dystrophin levels. So could you explain, you know, how that experiment was done, how many animals, why, why there was a sort of range and what the values were? Yeah, so there are um, the two sets of studies uh, that were shown. There's uh, one that was sort of a bracketed study looking across multiple tissues that had a really broad range. Um, and that broad range was because we were actually summarizing a group of data. Uh, it's a question we had received from others. So uh, it's actually, if I remember correctly, four or five different analogs uh, of our drug all put together. So this was during the early phase of our development. And as I said, we really focused in on non-human primates as our preclinical uh, pharmacology animal. Uh, but some of these early studies were looking at analogs. So that's part of the reason for the broad range. In the slide before that, uh, where we were looking at uh, a direct comparison with our own data, uh, with our own uh, hexaarginine sequence, that was a single uh, construct, if I remember, and I think it was five animals per group. Okay, thanks. And so did, do you also do any sort of functional tests in the mouse model in terms of either physiology or, um, you know, protection against eccentric contraction injuries? injury, there's a question here on, um, or any other sort of functional test. Yeah, we did look at uh, functional tests in some of the academic studies that were conducted. So these were not run by the company, but run by our academic collaborators. And we saw that the dystrophin being produced did result in a meaningful change in terms of those functional outputs. Um, as I said, you know, we've really tried to focus in on non-human primates in part because of the translatability of that model and what it'll teach us about moving forward with the correct dose and what impact we're likely to have when we move into patients. So most of the work the company done, has done has been mostly focused in non-human primates. Thanks. I'm just trying to... 
get my screen up here. Um, uh, question here on the um, immune response or potential immune response against peptides and whether that would um, impact any of your pharmacokinetics or approach. Yeah, we've conducted immunotoxicology studies. Um, and I will say one of my backgrounds is as an immunologist, so I was keen to do this. Um, and there's no uh, immunologic response, uh, uh, no significant immunologic response, both uh, screening against human T cells, as well as in non-human primate studies. Thanks. Um, So I'm going to shift gears a little bit in terms of asking. Uh, so we're starting in Exxon 51, right? Do I, did I get that correctly? Yep. And Q1 of next year, you think you'll be, um, do you know how, and I think you mentioned that you're looking also at, at 53, 45, 44, um, and working down the line. We have a question here specifically about 46. Do you, do you have a sense of how far behind those would be in terms of the other development programs you have? Yeah, we haven't put forward specific timelines around any uh, of the next DMD, but I will commit to going saying that we are looking at additional exon skippable patient populations. Uh, we've got one we've already started working on um, that we're exploring uh, the potential of our cell penetrant peptide to really improve uh, exon skipping with that oligonucleotide. Um, we're looking into two others right now, and my hope and expectation is we'll continue to expand into other populations. But unfortunately, I can't give you the time frame right now. Well, you know, we we appreciate and we'll invite you back to to update us on as as you you get closer to making those those decision, decisions. Um, other questions about the the trial uh, in you know. I know you might not be able to tell us much, but are you thinking that this would be a U.S.-based trial, or are you thinking, you know, um, you know, U.S., U.K.? What What are your plans there? Yeah, so um, we can't really comment on the clinical development program. Uh, we are planning on following sort of uh, what others have done in terms of the development program. Uh, we think there's a lot of advantage to doing that, both from the standpoint of regulatory authorities have seen this sort of strategy before, and so are more likely to be accepting of it, and we won't get any holds up, holdups on that. We also think it's useful from the standpoint of being able to produce for the community uh, comparable data so that we can go and compare our data to what has gone before us in very similar scenarios. Um, and that allow us to predict how we should develop this going forward. Okay. And so uh, just, um, there's a question here. You're, you're not currently recruiting for patients correct. for these trials. Sorry. Yes, you're, you're correct. Um, so we have not uh, started patient recruitment. Um, as soon as uh, we're approaching that point, we'll come back to the community, of course. Um, because one thing I've appreciated in, in, in my work uh, with uh, the Friedrich Ataxia Research Alliance is, is how this is only going to happen uh, in cooperation and collaboration really with the patient community. So uh, you will be among the earliest to know uh, before we tell other members of the public. Thanks. No, and we'll welcome having you back. Um, so more questions have been coming in as we've been talking. So I'll, I'm going to circle back to some of the um, some of the uh, earlier uh, preclinical studies. You, have you looked at renal toxicity in rats or monkeys at higher doses? Um, yeah. What was uh, the highest so, dose tested where you mentioned there was no toxicity? Yeah. So. Uh, right now, we've gone up to 60 mg per keg, and uh, we need to go higher. Um, at 60 mg per keg, we, as I'd mentioned, uh, see a transient increase in urea and creatine. It goes back down to baseline. Um, it's not accompanied by any uh, histologic sequelae of note. Um, and so we need to go to higher doses to actually go and determine what is the maximum tolerated dose. Um, and that said, I, fortunately, based on the efficiency of the system and what we're seeing in terms of exon skipping, I don't think we need to go anywhere near those doses. 
So I think we'll be much lower in terms of the dose range we're testing, but that said, we do need to go higher to really uh, uh, flesh out um, what we're seeing in terms of any toxicologic signals. And do you have any sense yet in terms of what sort of dosing, um, whether this will be weekly, monthly, you know, bi-weekly, what, what are you thinking, do you, or do you have any sense of that yet? Yeah, so to date, we've tested uh, every two weeks, um, and uh, we've seen really terrific results. We're now exploring once a month. We think there's utility in that for two major reasons. Um, one, from the standpoint of the patient and the families, it's a lot easier to come in once a month than it is every two weeks. Um, and we think from an efficacy standpoint, uh, given the very long half-life of dystrophin, that we'll see really good efficiency uh, with that. Um, the other reason is that uh, if we ever do begin to start seeing some meaningful uh, kidney signals, stretching out the dose to once a month, uh, we think will improve the tolerability. But like I said, so far, it's it's not been an issue for us. Okay. And, you know, there's a question here um, about, you know, um, whether or not you think that, uh, this is just sort of theoretical, right? Uh, whether um, being able to treat younger individuals sort of earlier in their disease course would, would bode for better outcomes. Yeah, so I do think that uh, there's utility to going to younger patients. Um, we're going to put together a safety ph pharmacology safety uh, toxicology package to go and allow us to treat uh, younger patients. Um, we'll have to, of course, take the guidance of regulatory authorities in terms of where we start, and we might anticipate having to start at 10 year olds and, uh, and, and older or something in that range and then slowly move our way down. Uh, but we absolutely agree. Uh, we need to, I think, start moving uh, to, to younger and younger patients. Thanks. And, you know, I'll just, I'm going to elaborate a little bit on the other parts of this question, sort of it's coming, you know, saying that for these rare diseases, we really sort of push for early diagnosis so that we can have early intervention and disease management. And I think that's absolutely true in terms of standards of care. And, and I think um, it's also good to, to know what's going on early and to know then what are your options in terms of a very evolving therapeutic landscape with new things um, in development at, at all the time. So um, I'll just comment on that as well. Yeah. And I saw, by the way, one of the questions asked about why do Exxon 51 or or other exon skipping approaches that currently have therapeutic, uh, therapeutics approved. And hopefully I, I, I was able to explain that, you know, while those may move the needle and, and may uh, change the progression of the disease, um, we don't think, and most people don't think that the levels of dystrophin expression that, that's occurring there is high enough. And so we think there's a tremendous uh, need even for those patients to see better therapeutics and get higher levels of, of dystrophin being expressed. A second advantage from a drug development standpoint and, and having spent over, well, almost 30 years now in drug development is that in following the paths that others have taken, we can both learn from their mistakes and learn from their successes and hopefully move faster. And we'll take that and not wait until we get to the end but as we're moving along that path, bring along other therapies as well. So we're really hoping that this will actually allow us to accelerate the development of therapies for uh, exon skippable patient populations outside of 51. Thank you. Um, I think we're, we're pretty much gone through most of the questions. Uh, I'm just doing another quick look. Uh, we have up on the screen where, if anyone listening has a question that they think up later, where you can contact Cure Duchenne, but who um, on the PepGen team is the, what's the best way for a patient community contact to get in touch on your side, James? Um, for the moment, I would suggest uh, directing it uh, through me. I think Jane Larkendale, who's joined our team, will probably end up uh, uh, dealing on a, on a, on a case-by-case uh, -case basis there, but if it turned out to be a more clinically oriented one, I would uh, then have our chief medical officer uh, uh, manage it. So uh, folks can reach out to me 
and and I'll make certain that either I or one of my team uh, address it. Terrific. And you can always, you know, use Secure Duchenne email too, and we'll direct it to yeah. PepGen as well. I'm just going to do one last look to make sure there's nothing I missed. Um, I think we're all set. You know, James, just thank you again so much for taking time out of your day and to share this information with the community. You know, at Cure Duchenne, as Deborah said in her intro, you know, we believe in the promise of XM skipping. And so we really appreciate all the work that PepGen is doing. Oh, terrific. I think the, the work that Cure Duchenne is doing is absolutely critical to advancing new therapies. So um, we really appreciate your support. We really appreciate the support of the community. Uh, we look forward to having lots of engagements uh, with the community uh, and, and getting your questions and, and hopefully uh, being able to address them satisfactorily. Thank you. And for everyone listening, um, again, thank you for taking time out of your day to join and for your insightful questions. Uh, I'll note this webinar uh, was recorded and it will be available for viewing on the Cure Duchenne website very soon. You will receive a post webinar email and you know you don't you don't have don't hesitate to contact our team with any additional questions. And with that, um, James, I think uh, I'll wish you and everyone else uh, a wonderful day and thank you again. Super, thanks ever so much.